This week on Hidden Heritage, we're going to take a look at a unique group of individuals. As we've traveled across the country, we've come across various people who are doing wonderful things for our culture. Now, these are people that are pioneering new fronts for us, whether it's in the world of business or whether it's in the world of arts or whether it's something that's completely off the charts. These are the people that are the role models for our youth. Let's take a look at what we call our native entrepreneurs. Well, my name is Lisa Little Chief Bryan. I'm an enrolled member of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. And currently, I live in Vermilion, South Dakota. Um, I'm a professor at the University of South Dakota there and an entrepreneur. And uh, tend to travel quite a bit between the Rosebud Reservation and Vermilion. We have a ranch on the Rosebud Reservation as well. Well, I always say that I was an entrepreneur at the age of 10. And I basically was in 4-H, and I loved 4-H. I believed I was the best costume designer and, and fashion designer in the world and, and with maybe creating like three or four pieces. That was about it. But I thought they were great. And so I actually was always involved with beadwork, quilting. My mother had taught me to crochet, to knit. And so I was pretty crafty. I had a lot of different uh, visions in terms of how I would create products. And I actually began to sell those products as I was in my teenage years. And so my entrepreneurial spirit, spirit carried through. And by the time I was 21, I wrote my first business plan and had submitted that to the Small Business Administration, received about $27,000 and thought I was so wealthy, it was amazing. I actually wrote a business plan to start a, an art quilting type business. It was actually an applique art quilt. Well, education has always been very important to me. And I actually started college, took my first few college courses at the age of 16. I actually received my GED when I was 16. I had try I was actually I had my first child, Clayton, and decided I high school just wasn't for me. And it was very hard for me because I was an athlete. I played basketball, ran track. And so I started taking college classes. And at that time, I wanted to be an English major because I am a writer and I love to write books. And so I thought, well, I'll pursue an English career kind of changed a lot of different majors in my undergrad. It took me quite a long time to finish. If you keep in mind, I started I started my undergrad program in 1983, and I didn't finish my undergrad program until 1993. So I was in school for 10 years. And I got a call from, from Sintagleshka University, and the department chair was moving, and she was starting her own business, and she wanted me to take over her position and be the department chair and, and instructor at the Tribal College of Business. And I said, well, you know, I have to tell you something. I said, I graduated with, with an undergrad degree in psychology, and I don't know anything about business. And she said, yeah, but you're an entrepreneur, and I believe you can teach these classes. So to continue on with my education, so I, I, worked, I actually was employed at, at Sintagleshka for about 10 years and many different aspects. I was the Tribal Business Information Center director, but all along I, kept, I was also a professor and continued to teach. I enrolled in a master's program at Southern New Hampshire University which was a 18-month executive master's program in business where I would fly to New Hampshire once a month for three days. And then you actually completed most of your coursework online and through the internet and finished my degree in about, I think it was about 2000, it must have been about 1999, 2000. I'm not quite sure when I graduated from there. I've been in school forever. And then I decided, well, why just continue on? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and continue with my PhD. And so I, I enrolled in the, in 2000, I enrolled in the Union Institute and Universities program, PhD in entrepreneurship. I also like to talk about my mother because my mother's been involved with my business since basically I was a child. She, as I mentioned earlier, she taught me um, all the skills needed in terms of being a great craftsperson. And, and of course, the quilting business wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been attainable if it wasn't for my mom. And so as we move forward, my mother is still a huge part of our, our business today. And uh, we always say that when we're packaging our, our product and our fry bread mix, we listen to grandma or mom. That's just how it is. She tells us how, how to do things and we all listen. At that time, my mom and I and my husband had kind of talked about the fry bread, and we knew we had an excellent recipe. And I like to talk about Black Hill State again just one more time, because as I was the president of the Native American Studies program at BH, we would have fundraisers, and of course, we would have Indian taco sales. And all the students that would, would arrive to purchase a taco, they were like, oh my gosh, this fry bread is amazing. You should package it and sell it. 
So we kind of had that in the back of our mind that we really should package this bread mix and do something with it. And so that summer we were we were kind of getting creative and we thought, well, how would we package the fry bread mix? And we decided that a little rustic bag, we had, my mom had some of the rustic flour sacks that just said flour and had little three X's at the underneath and then the weight at the bottom. And, you know, we said, that's a pretty cute little idea. So we decided we'd get some muslin and my mom and I are seamstresses. So we sewed up the bags and We had no way of marking them. And we thought, well, what are we going to do? So we ordered a rubber stamper and we actually crawled around on the floor. So we'd lay, we'd lay these bags out on the floor about 50 at a time. And I would rubber stamp each bag. So we actually assembled the, the product in our, in our home. Yeah, that summer. And I thought, well, okay, we made the product. Now what are we going to do? We, I guess we got to figure out if we can sell it. So I, I love to talk about Wall Drug and Mount Rushmore because they were our two first accounts that we ever sold to. And I took a little trip to, to Wall. It wasn't very far from our ranch, about an hour and a half drive. And I met with the the buyer for the specialty food department. And he said, yeah, we'll give it a shot. And, and it went exceptionally well. The product sold fantastic that summer. And our test market was basically Wall Drug and Mount Rushmore. And then we moved to, we, we decided, well, we'll branch out. And we went to El's Oasis and a lot of the airport gift shops. And within a year's time, we had about 80 stores that sold our fry bread mix in South Dakota. The Indian taco is kind of a modern day recipe. My mom did share with me the fact that when we used to make fry bread traditionally, it was actually a bread. It was something that you would dip in your soup or you actually might have just had a little bit of bread with a little sugar or, or powdered sugar or cinnamon or something on the side. The traditional way of eating fry bread was actually to prepare it with wojapi, and wojapi is actually a traditional choke cherry pudding that that the uh, elders and a lot of, you know, my grandmother had a great recipe for wojapi. And so you'd actually cut your fry bread in a little triangle and then you'd dip it into, into your pudding. However, we have transitioned into what we call, of course, an, an Indian taco. And I like to say Native American taco or American Indian taco, but it doesn't quite ring. So I guess it's just an Indian taco. And that seems to be what most uh, consumers are familiar with. But what we're going to do today is basically I'll show you how easy our product is to make. And basically, you just throw the, the you place the contents of the, of the bag into a bowl and you add water and, and we're going to actually prepare an Indian taco. So I'm actually going to just take you as if you were just purchasing, you have just purchased this bag of fry bread mix. You are the consumer. And I'm going and to you show you. And you package those all by hand, right? Yep. Yep. It's all by hand. And the directions are inside the bag. We just take the contents of this bag. Make sure you get everything out of there. There's a little bit of sugar and all of our ingredients are, we hand pack every one of these mm-hmm. bags. And so it tends to, the sugar tends to settle to the bottom of the bag. All you do is add two cups of water. It doesn't matter if it's warm water or cold water. Too hot a water would probably won't work, but two. And we do mention on the directions there are two cups of lukewarm water. Okay. We just mix this around. You want to make sure you have a well-floured surface. So we we do indicate that in the directions as well. Mm-hmm. And it's going to look a little bit kind of a... Looks like pudding almost. And you're going to say, oh my gosh, how am I going to do anything with a mix like this? <laughs> Is there a trick to know when you stop or where you're at the well, right point? For- no, you just mi- basically you just mix it till you don't have any dry ingredient left. That's pretty easy so yeah. far. So you take a spoonful of this mm-hmm. and you actually drop it right into a, if you want to take a look at how much flour I have there, I to make sure you mm-hmm. use a well-floured surface. Okay. And you just begin to roll the fry bread and you get it. Just a, a nice cover of of flour on the on the product, mm-hmm. and we do talk about this that you have to roll this in the directions. Okay, and so you're going to have a little a little ball of fry bread mix like this, and you just begin to pat it out. Mm-hmm. And we like to do a plate size because we're actually going to do an Indian taco here today. Okay, so you do a nice little plate size, and I always say that you actually can do it's about six to eight inches. Mm-hmm. 
And then you actually, I kind of like to leave a little bit of a hole in the center because as you're frying the bread, Mm -hmm. you need a little room. Okay. And so that hole is just perfect right there. And so you want to have your temperature at 350 degrees or or higher, okay. uh, maybe 350, 375. You need to cook the bread and it takes, it's pretty fast. If the oil is hot, you're going to know because mm-hmm. it's going to bubble. Okay. And you, we say about 30 seconds to a minute mm. on each side. Okay. But the oil is key. It has to be hot. If your oil is, uh, is not 350 to 375 degrees, you're going to have trouble because mm-hmm. it won't cook. Mm-hmm. So you can let that. I use a fork. Okay. You can use a tongs if you'd like. So that forks seem to work well. And as you let it cook there, and I always just kind of pull it to the side. Mm-hmm. And let it drip a little, and you can put it on on a paper towel if you'd like. Sure. Now, but you been... know, it's it's good and greasy, so it really doesn't good matter. And yeah. Now, now that's been about two minutes or so. That we, that's been yeah. in there, maybe a minute, minute yeah. to, to two minutes. Right. And that's it. Now we, yeah. that's the basic part so of our. That's your, the fry bread. Yep. There's your fry bread. And now we're actually going to to create an Indian taco. I can't wait. Now, okay, Lisa, I'm with you so far. I think I could handle almost every step that's gone from the dough to the to the oil and out. Now, but now we get to have this is the creative part. We get to have a little fun here. So, what what happens first? Okay, well, what we're going to do now is we have our nice piece of fry bread, and it's kind of cooled down a little bit. So this is perfect because we can actually. We actually have a, a nice taco built here. We're just going to put a little bit of the bean and hamburger mixture. Mm-hmm. And I like to put a lot of a lot of the beans and hamburger on. And I'm kind of a perfectionist, so I like to build my tacos so that everything sits right in the middle of the taco. Oh, we're you know? hard enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, I like them to be pretty when I'm all done with this. So put a little bit of the lettuce on here. And we'll get that all put on. And then we do some tomatoes. And, of course, you can add about anything you'd like on the taco. You can add onions. So if a person liked hot peppers, you could put a little jalapeno yep. on there just to customize it to your own taste. Yeah, I'm not point. putting any onion, onions on this one today. Basically, we're just going to do the the meat mixture, the lettuce, tomatoes. And Laura, would you like to add a little cheese yes, to that? Sure. This is my daughter, Laura. Yeah. She helps a lot with our... She's made more than one of these better over the time. Oh, oh, yeah. Gosh, it's All right. And I, I think we're just going to place it right here. Laura? I have to admit, it looks very good. Yeah. And this is the world-famous... Indian taco. Yes. Yes. And actually, it's it's kind of amazing because they are excellent and they're very filling. So, and that's that. It, yep. They always say it's power fuel for the power dancers. That's too. right. <laughs> and this is the actual product. Just keep in mind, it's all, all you do is add water. And yeah. I've seen these around. So you can find them. At, you'll see them around at gift stores. Yep. Specialty food shops, Just, gourmet shops. You can actually find them at most park services across the United States and then in some select supermarkets. And we don't normally name the name of the supermarkets because we're never sure right, you know, yeah. where we're at. But I for that. sure, you can find it in the specialty food shops. Very good. Yes. Well, our company, Mother Earth Eco Remediation, deals with water pollution. And what we do is we have a product that we put inside interceptors and grease traps. But what happens is a lot of times that that fats, oils, and grease gets put into the rivers and streams by accident or by runoff. Uh, Right now, we are licensed in Oklahoma, California, and Arizona, and very quickly we're moving to other regions where there is a high population of Native Americans. We are a full service company. Whenever a contract is signed with us, we take over all those responsibilities except for if a facility is scheduled by the state to have a pump out. Some, some, some states require a facility to have a scheduled pump out, pump out every, every month, once a month or something. What, what happens is whenever they're, they're cooking and they're washing the dishes, 
even though they're scraping the plates and everything like that, there's still a small amount of grease that goes down the sink. And what happens is at that point, that grease sticks to the walls and it goes into their interceptors. The interceptor is what catches all of those grease, all of the grease and the fat and the oils before it actually gets to the waste center. And what happens is after so long that that grease builds up on those walls, those pipe, those pipe walls, and it closes it off just like your arteries in your, in your body, body going to your heart. If your arteries get closed off, then that's when you have heart attacks and everything like that. What makes us different from any other product out there, we're non-caustic, non-pollutant, non-corrosive, non-toxic. The only people that can actually be hurt by our bacteria is somebody that has a, a compromised immune system. How I got involved, it, it's kind of like one of those things that's meant to be, you know, in our end in ways. Sometimes you're put down that path and it doesn't matter which way you go. When the creator wants you to get to a certain point, he's going to lead you to that certain point. There's other things that are going into the, the rivers and streams, you know, besides those fat swells and grease. But uh, we're trying to do our part to take care of it. There can be a lot of arguments there because back in those days, our people felt that nobody should own the land. But the rightful caretakers of Mother Earth, you know, that's what we are. And it's not only our responsibility now as Native Americans, but it's for the responsibility of all all people that live here in the United States and the world, you know, to take care of Mother Earth, take care of our, our most precious thing, that water, that sacred water. We have a product, a pond clarifier, and the pond clarifier, it, uh, it stabilizes or it uh, maintains or it balances out the microecology of the pond. And by doing that, you, you reduce those, uh, algae blooms. Now, this product as well, it uh, works on bacteria, but it's a bacteria that is safe for fish, for cows, for horses, safe for any animals that go into that water. And it cuts down, it, it performs, it outperforms all of those things. It outperforms the ammonia nitrates and the nitrites that are in the pond that are produced by the proteins that are put into the pond or run off from fertilizer and things like that. We have, we're work, we have the pond clarifier, the drain cleaner. The drain cleaner is what we use on the interceptors and all of those. And then we also have a floor cleaner with some major corporations to use our product. The Choctaw Casino and Choctaw Nation uh, were the first to use our product. And, you know, they they feel very strongly about going green, you know, and going green is something that's that's a good thing, you know, by saving energy, cutting down on the carbon footprint. But our company, it cuts down on that that wastewater and the pollutants. It's it's a different thing. It's about going, I guess more or less going blue, you know, saving saving that water resource. What makes it unique, I think, is that the way it's put together. Like again, I'm going back to my colors and the kind of beads, you know, turquoise that I use. And uh, there's just there's just an art form, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, when I first started, I had a one 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 table, and with just a few of my necklaces, and it sold really well. And I thought, hmm, I'm gonna. See if see how the next show goes. So I added now I've got five tables. I always get compliments from my display. You know, the way I that's another thing that I was I think first impressions are important. So I put a lot of effort in my display and the way I display my my jewelry and yeah, I'm up to five five tables now. Well, congratulations to you as an artist. My next phase is to go home since my children are grown and all on their own right now. So I thought it's time to go home. And what I really like to do is teach some of the Navajo women what I've learned off reservation and work with some of the young men, teach them how to make those arrows that are selling very well right now. And uh, just to give them some some hope and some encouragement. At the reservation, right? Mm-hmm. That does. Yeah. No, just, just traveling, I think it's given... My customers, you know, asking me questions about my reservation and just has given me a heart to just just want to go back, you know, to my own people and just be very encouraging. So now while you're back home, will you still continue to make jewelry yourself? Yes. And I probably won't travel as much because the cost of living is not as expensive as Chicago. So thinking maybe just once or twice a weekend, I'll probably be gone. And the rest of the time, just, 
you know, work with the Navajo people. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it's wonderful. I would say you've got some determination inside you that you've probably haven't discovered yet. And the more you go about whatever you want to do, I think that the more you just, you learn about yourself and you discover, I think you surprise yourself a lot of things and just keep whatever your heart tells you, just keep, keep going and keep striving. What would you say would you have to sell? It's, it's, it's a lot of work, but it's, it's, it's worth it. I think doing it with somebody, having a partner is, it's, it's, it makes it more enjoyable than doing it. I I think alone is just sharing that, you know, with, with somebody makes it uh, more fun. Yes, I, to me, I, I looked at it as an opportunity and uh, just seeing the country has been really good. I was, you know, I was, first time I saw Niagara Falls, I was just in awe. You know, I think just, I'm very fortunate. I'm one of those Navajos that have gotten off reservation to see the country. You know, so that's, it's, it's been fun. Like any other culture from anywhere around the planet, it's important that we have our pioneers and our entrepreneurs. These are the people and the individuals from within our culture that will help to break new ground at the same time, maintain the integrity of our Native American ways. One last time, we want to thank these entrepreneurs and business people from around various tribes for the advancements and for the progress they have made for our culture. Hidden Heritage, stories from across Native America. 